well, it's faster. R loads all the object into memory so that it can analyze faster and actually get the result faster. So why is it faster? It's because it avoids something called a von Neumann bottleneck. So before I go deep into what is von Neumann bottleneck, I think it's worth go down memory lane a little bit and understand who is John von Neumann. So John von Neumann is one of the most important computer scientists, mathematician and physicists of, I will say the last century. So he's born in 1903 in Budapest and he, by the age of eight, he's already familiar with things like calculus and ancient Greek. He got his PhD in 23, and he's one of the first person to help to develop ENIAC, which is used for a lot of weather forecasting. But sadly, he dies quite young at the age of 53 because of cancer. But before that, he's already being commissioned as one of the five atomic energy commissioners. So he has done amazing things in his life. And one of the most amazing things I think he did because you know, I'm biased, I'm in computer science, is called the von Neumann architecture. So how does a computer today basically work is actually based on the von Neumann architecture. So computer, you can think of it as a magic box that do some logic on it. But before it can actually do any logic, you have to connect it to an input device. In this case, maybe a keyboard, maybe a mouse, maybe, a, maybe your webcam, just input data into your computer. And after the computer do something and some magic happens, it has an output device. So in this case, the output device can be a printer, a monitor and so on. So we're not gonna really talk about input and output and how does the CPU actually does all this logic. But what we really need to focus on is how the central processing unit or the CPU actually interact with the memory unit. So there's two main type of memory use um, inside a computer. Well, there's cache, but they're usually baked into the CPU and we don't have access to it. So I'm not gonna go deep into it. But the two type of memory system that I wanna talk about is the RAM and the secondary storage. So imagine a chef trying to cook a pot of soup. You can think of a RAM as the shelf around the kitchen where it's very easy to access and very fast to get, but you know, they're, they're relatively small space compared to like the secondary storage, which is kind of like your basement or your attic, where it is further away, but there's a lot more storage space, right? So uh, inside your computer, there's almost always a RAM and a storage, and the RAM are usually smaller, around eight to 32 gigabyte, depends on what computer do you have, and the storage usually around 256 gigabyte to four terabyte, okay? So RAM are smaller, but expensive, right? but they are very, 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 very fast, especially when you want to do a random access. For example, you want to get an onion and you want to get a potato straight away. But the storage, even though they are very, very cheap, uh, they can be of much bigger size, means that for per dollar, you can get maybe 10 to 20 times more memory. Uh, they're relatively slow and they're usually connected over things like the SATA bus and newer standard like NVMe helps a little bit, but it's still much, much lower than RAM. Okay, however, storage is a good thing is that they're not volatile and RAM is volatile. So if you lose any kind of power, means you power down your computer, everything inside your storage will be there, but RAM will be gone. Okay, so they're built to do very different thing. RAM is fast, it's more, it's used to store whatever things that you need immediately now. You need to calculate them, you need it now, you need it fast, they'll be stored in the RAM. However, if you have things that, uh, that, that you need it later, and there's a huge file, for example, your game library, your photos, your video, uh, they're put in storage and they can be there for five years, 10 years, and you always be there. And you know, uh, you only load them in when you want it to. So the von Weimann bottleneck actually described the slow connection between how a computer wants to transfer the data from your secondary storage into your RAM and then into your CPU, okay? So for the CPU that actually calculates anything, it needs to be inside the RAM. So if it's in the secondary storage, what they do is that they'll send a signal so that, so that they will take the storage, they'll take the data from the secondary storage into the RAM and then they're only able to, to calculate properly. 
okay so i actually did a very very small exercise inside r so i'm gonna put the code directly into the video description down below so you can try so what i try to do is to simulate an uh, environment in terms of you know if i have a matrix file and i run it in r directly within the object and the second situation where i have the same matrix but I save it as a CSV and I try to load in things line by line by line by line. Okay, so every single time I want to calculate certain things, it needs to load in from the hard drive. So it should be a lot slower. So you can see that uh, for the first thing, for the line one and two, is to run a garbage collection. So a garbage collection is kind of a process where they free up unused memory in R so that uh, anything that is left over from your previous project doesn't contaminate this. And it is very useful to run uh, GC once in a while in your code so that you don't actually get all the junk you know, store in your memory and so on. So what I do next is to create a sample CSV with about, I believe 10,000 or 100,000, 100,000 element. And I pipe the 100,000 element into a matrix with 100, 100 uh, column, a colored row, 100 column. Yeah, some of one of them where the column is divided by 100. Okay, there's 100 column. So, and then I write the same matrix onto my, onto my drive, okay? So the next one is I create a matrix with a hundred row and actually why I do that is because it will be faster to loop through uh, the, the, the for loop later on. If you don't create a file first and you try to loop through and try to increase the file size one by one, it's very slow. So you can, you can actually check my other video on how to make a loop faster on that. So the first situation here is to use the system time function to track the time. So you can see that for i in 1 to 100 means the loop from 1 to 100, I load in 100 rows one by one and calculate the sum one by one. Okay, so in this, and then after I've done the first situation, I remove the object and I refresh the object into a new object so that it's it's fairer to compare the two condition. Okay, so then I do the second uh, condition where I use sample CSV small equals uh, assigned to CSV file CSV and row equals to I means I load in the row one by one and then I calculate the sum and pipe it into our summary uh, summary object uh, in row by row. So they're individually calculated. So what happens is the first condition only takes 0 0.02 seconds and the second condition takes about 46.55 seconds. So yes, it's massively, massively faster to run things inside the RAM. Uh, but do take note that this is more like an extreme condition. There are overhead, there are calculations, there are different kind of situation and thing in between uh, comparing RAM speed and SSD speed in this case on my computer. But it, it, it does develop the point of adding things in between of that transfer, where every time you have a data transfer, it all, almost always slows things down. So which is why, if possible, we always try to put everything into our RAM so that it's easier. So of course, the, the pro and cons of why R put everything into the RAM is that it's a lot faster in situation where uh, you have more than enough RAM, okay? If you don't have enough RAM, it's much slower. But of course, the problem is that it's less memory efficient. So if you don't have enough memory to contain the object, uh, it's gonna, you know, go to the page file, swap in and out, and actually make things a lot slower than it can be. So it also requires frequent garbage collection. You have to be very aware of how the computer actually uses your memory, and in certain times, clear them out manually, because R is not able to do it efficiently for you because they don't really know what you're doing unless you code it out. So there are of course a few workaround of how the OS, how you can actually uh, try to navigate around the system for efficient calculation. The first one is to use things like Windows 10 or Mac OS, like I think 11 afterwards, where they actually have memory compression in the operating system. So what, tr what this is trying to do is that if you have eight gigabyte of RAM in your computer, you can actually use more than eight gigabyte of memory by compressing those memory uh, with certain logic. So what you're doing is that you're trading computing power for space. 
right? You have eight gigabyte, you can compress that into six gigabyte. So you actually uses less memory, but that compression and decompression takes time and computing power. So it will slow the computer down a little bit, but at least you are able to run what you need to do. Otherwise, you know, it will actually access the page file and virtual memory and do all the memory dumping here and there. Okay, so if you really don't have a memory and you really have a big matrix, for example, you're working with cow matrix with 100,000 gene, for example, I don't know what uh, animal has 100,000 gene, but if you really need to access such big table, you can actually use the big memory package in R with actually uh, trick the system on, op on as an object that actually doesn't store directly in the RAM. So it pretends to be a full object, but that object is actually stored in a hard drive. So every time you need a certain object, you actually directly read from hard, from your hard drive or secondary storage. So if you have, for example, a NVMe storage, uh, it should actually works fine. They are a little bit overhead, but you know, in certain situation, if you have a 15 gigabyte or 20 gigabyte file, what are you gonna do? Buy a new computer? Right, so these are one of the package I will encourage you to look into. So the next one will be just write your code more efficient, right? Efficient uh, looping strategies. When you're doing a for loop, especially what I did just now, when you did a hundred iteration, uh, there's certain step that you can take that you can actually make your calculation a lot faster, even if you're running out of RAM and you know you are running around with all this restriction that you have. There's certain things you can do. So instead of actually buying more RAM, you can just make your code more efficient uh, in certain other things so that the time save is about the same. So the last one, maybe just learn some other language that doesn't actually use so much memory. But of course, you have to maybe pipe the library over, recode some of the thing to work. But generally, I would say R and Python are very similar to each other. And anyone that can code Python can code R. Anyone can code R can code Python maybe with two three weeks of transition and so on. So that's basically what I want to say. The von Neumann bottleneck is the bottleneck between the secondary storage and the RAM. It's usually the slowest transfer speed you have in your computer, and which is why to get around this bottleneck, R tries to put everything into memory. At least that's what I think they're trying to do. I didn't actually find a proper documentation to say that. But there is a cert there's a lot of benefit of putting all the object in the RAM so that the calculation is way, way faster than all the read and write that you're gonna face in your computer. So that's all I want to say for today. I hope you learned something about von Neumann Vordenac and why R uses so many memory. So R uses so many memory. <laughs> okay. Thanks you for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Bye.